This is going to be a look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Not only did this come up in my verse-by-verse -verse, uh, studies, because I just did 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, but I also got uh, several emails about it, asking questions about things within this chapter and around this chapter. But this chapter is one of the most controversial chapters in the Bible. And I believe this chapter has more disagreement amongst Bible believers than any other chapter in the Pauline epistles. You're going to find Bible believers that believe the same on almost everything will have disagreements about things within this chapter. So, I'm not dogmatic about the way I see 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I'm completely open to correction. I've been looking at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 since I got saved in 2010, I began studying on it pretty heavy about two years ago, and I, I mean, I've been reading it the whole time I was saved, studying pretty heavy on it about two years ago. I'm still not completely sure about a few things in the chapter, and I pray that you'll give me grace and patience as you listen. As I said, I'm open to correction for anyone to show me the way of God more perfectly. The past two years, I've most likely heard every interpretation among Bible believers pertaining to the chapter. And since 2 Thessalonians 2 has a lot of doubt among most Bible believers you listen to, and there are more very clear verses in the Bible, we should interpret 2 Thessalonians 2 in light of the more clear verses in Scripture and not use 2 Thessalonians 2 to interpret the entire Bible. There are plenty of places in the Bible that show us the outline of when certain prophetical events occur that we don't have <clears throat> we're not going to have to interpret the whole Bible in light of this one chapter but rather use the entirety of the Bible to make sure that we don't let one chapter mess us up on all of our prophecy something that is going to help when you you start 2 Thessalonians 2 is realizing in the two previous chapters, before you get to 2 Thessalonians 2, that the context has been heavily on the second coming of Jesus. And that is an event when Jesus comes back on a white horse in flaming fire, taking vengeance, and the saints are already with him at this time, and he's coming back down with us. And this is an event that happens at least seven years after he comes in the rapture, and we meet the Lord in the air, and what people refer to as the rapture. So, the second coming is different from the rapture, and I believe the context in the two previous chapters was heavy on that second coming. Remember that in 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul began to talk about the day of the Lord when Jesus Christ comes back with a vengeance. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 4, he says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Notice that phrase, Peace and safety, in 1 Thessalonians 5.3. That is what people will be saying during the first part of the tribulation, during that beginning of sorrows. This is where the Antichrist has been blinded with a false peace. And that time period can be called the beginning of sorrows, as Jesus calls it in Matthew 24, 8. He says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Even though the wrath is still going to be poured out during that time, there will be a false peace and safety brought about by the Antichrist's false kingdom and his covenant with God's people during that time, it will cause people to say, peace, peace, when there is no peace. And the Antichrist is going to get a deadly head wound in the middle of the tribulation. You can read about that in Revelation 13. And his deadly wound will be healed. He will resurrect to counterfeit the resurrection of Jesus. He'll break his covenant with God's people during that time. And he will sit in the temple claiming to be God. He will continue his false kingdom for another three and a half years. At this time, things really go south for the world. And things get even more deadly when Jesus Christ comes back at the 
end of that last three and a half years. So Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 and 3, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. That's the second coming. For when they shall say peace and safety in the first part of the tribulation, and probably the people who worship the Antichrist are still going to have a, a false peace and a false hope all the way up to the end. But then it says, Then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Notice it says, They say peace and safety. The Antichrist, also called the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast, is going to have them thinking everything is still going to be okay. But then when you get to that second part of the trib, the Lord calls it great tribulation in Matthew 24, 21. And Jeremiah 30 and verse 7 calls it the time of Jacob's trouble. When you get to that time, and especially the time of the second coming of Jesus Christ, they are going to see sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon the woman with child, and they will not escape. But then Paul says in verse 4, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. If you're saved then you don't even have to worry about that day. And that day, you're going to be following the Lord on a white horse. You're going to be with the Lord. And then 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, if you go down a few verses in that chapter, gives us plenty of proof to show us that we aren't going through that horrible future time period. And it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So you can see that the main theme of 1 Thessalonians 5 is the second coming of Jesus Christ. To be more specific, when he comes back with the saints, and not to get his saints. He's already came back and got us at that point. The main theme of the previous chapter before 1 Thessalonians 5 and 1 Thessalonians 4 is when he comes to get his saints. Okay, then you get into 2 Thessalonians 1. After 1 Thessalonians 5, you got 2 Thessalonians 1. The context, again, will be heavy. The second coming of Jesus Christ. Look at 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 12. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have established that when we go to, into 2 Thessalonians 2, our minds should be more focused on the second coming of Jesus Christ when he comes back with us and not so much focused on the rapture when he comes to get us. Because the focus is on Jesus Christ coming back with a vengeance and flaming fire in 2 Thessalonians 1. And it's focused on the day of the Lord, the second coming in 1 Thessalonians 5. Now, in chapters like this, you really got the mind tricks of the devil and, and, all, and unclean spirits trying to shake your faith. They're trying to shake your mind, exactly what they were trying to do with the Thessalonians. And ha have you in doubt and in fear about things. Look at 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 and 2. It says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So concerning the coming of Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him, Paul doesn't want them to be shaken or troubled. And he says, neither by spirit. Because sometimes our own spirit can get the best of us and make us get shook or make us have doubts, fears, anxiety, depression. It might start saying, where is the promise of his coming? Your own man's spirit can leave you shaken when you aren't guided by the Holy Spirit. So he says, neither by spirit. And then he says, nor by word. In Ezekiel 2, 6, the Lord tells Ezekiel, Ezekiel to be not afraid of their words. Man is good at opening his mouth 
And a lot of men are used by the forces of darkness to open their mouth and deceive the saints, to discourage the saints, to try their best to defeat the saints. Paul says, don't be shaken or troubled by word. Then he says, nor by letter as from us. Now this is key. Because there were men sending out phony epistles and forging Paul's name, these epistles, which are letters, had false doctrine. We know for certain that there were men saying the resurrection is past already. In 2 Timothy 2, 17 and 18, it says, And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. These letters were making the Thessalonians think that they missed the rapture and that events of the day of Christ, such as the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb, were taking place or about to take place. And if they were about to take place or taking place, then that means they missed the rapture. And instead of going out in a rapture, they were going to be around for the day of the Lord when Jesus comes back in flaming fire and be on the receiving end of that. And since the Thessalonians have been shaken in mind, Paul is beseeching them. This means he's urgently entreating the Thessalonians. He is beseeching them by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by gathering together into him. And a lot of great Bible teachers I like will make this the rapture of the church. Most most of them do in First Thess or Second Thessalonians one, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and gathering together into Him. However, I believe it's referring to the previous chapter, and the previous chapter, Second Thessalonians one. This is where it referred to the coming of Jesus Christ, and this is in the context of Him coming down in flaming fire, taking vengeance. And I don't believe that's the rapture of the church. So look at Second Thessalonians one again. In verses 7 through 10, it says, and to, you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired and all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. In that day, that phrase is associated with the day of the Lord, events of the day of the Lord, the second coming throughout the Bible. I believe the context in Second Thessalonians 1 is the second coming. And notice that when he comes in Second Thessalonians chapter 1, that he's revealed from heaven, he's in flaming fire taking vengeance, and he's punishing those who... Know not God and obey not the truth. And these are things that happen at the revelation of Jesus Christ when he comes down and touches the ground, not the event of the rapture of the church when he simply meets us in the air. So when we get back to 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 1, Paul says, Now, now we beseech you. So it seems he's continuing where he left off with the context being on the second coming. So now you can see why I believe this is the second coming, not the rapture. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together into him. So to me, it seems like it would be the same coming from the previous chapter, not referring to us meeting the Lord in the air and the rapture as in 1 Thessalonians 4, but the actual second coming where Jesus touches the ground with us following him on white horses. Now notice Paul says, by our gathering together unto him. We aren't just, we are gathered together to, unto him at the rapture of the church. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. But we're also gathered together when he comes back down with us. In Jude 14, it's, it says, And Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. We are his army that gathers behind him and comes back with him at the second coming. We were already left in the rapture before the tribulation. We're going through the judgment seat of Christ, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Then we come back with the Lord. We're gathered together behind him, coming back down on white horses. And not only church-age saints gather to the Lord at the second coming, but tribulation saints as well. You see, we, the saints from the church age, as I said, went out in a rapture before the tribulation. Don't get confused. And the tribulation saints also have something like a rapture close to the end of the tribulation. 
They will be gathered together while we will be following the Lord on white horses coming down out of heaven. The tribulation saints on earth during that time will be gathered together with us. And they are the elect gathered together in Matthew 24, 31. The post-trib pre-wrath guys teach that's our rapture. But that's a completely different rapture. And although we don't go out in the same rapture as the tribulation saints, we will meet up with them when we leave heaven with the Lord. I believe this is a gathering together. Also, once again, in the previous chapter, in 2 Thessalonians 1, 10, you got it talks about being glorif him being glorified in his saints, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints, and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. He is admired and glorified in his saints that are gathered together in that day. <clears throat> well, let me make this clear. I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that on what gathering together is referring to. I'd be lying if I said I was for sure. I've also heard it taught that Paul is simply referring to them gathering together in a congregational setting, which this could be true because he used similar wording in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 4, referring to when the Corinthians gathered together in that sense of being in a, congr in a congregation. But don't let the forces of darkness shake your mind. They can do that by causing you to simply fight over what these verses mean. The spiritual wickedness in high places can shake your mind. Just like the uh, Thessalonians here, they were shaken in mind over when that rapture actually took place or did it already take place, and it left them with fear and doubt. Now, we're forced, we're faced with something else. In verse 2, well, let's read 1 and 2 again. Now, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now we are faced with something else. What is the day of Christ referring to? There are so many different beliefs among Bible believers about the day of Christ, especially when it comes to how they see it in 2 Thessalonians 2. So the last thing I would ever want to do is argue about it or break fellowship over it. We don't want to do that. I personally believe that the day of Christ is associated with events that concern the church, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. These events are things like the pre-tribulation rapture, the judgment seat of Christ, the marriage supper of the Lamb. The problem in 2 Thessalonians 2 comes about when people limit the day of Christ to just one event. The rapture. They limit it to only the rapture. And they go to Second Thessalonians 2. And all they're thinking about is the rapture of the church. When we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And this is how confusing comes. Because then they'll say well. If the day of Christ is at hand. The people were being sent letters about the day of Christ being at hand. So this proves that the falling away and the man of sin have to be revealed before the rapture. Now, most Bible believers do teach that the day of Christ does refer to the rapture and judgment seat of Christ. However, in this chapter, they say there is an exception and that the day of Christ here refers to the day of the Lord. So at the same time, they say it gives another proof of the deity of Jesus Christ because it's equating the day of Christ with the day of the Lord, calling Jesus Lord. And I don't have anything against that. It sounds good to me. I just have a little bit of a different view here. I still believe the day of Christ here is referring to events that are associated with the church. But it is events that take place after the rapture. Because the Thessalonians are shaken in mind about it being at hand. If it were simply just the rapture. If uh, those false teachers were sending them letters saying... Um, the rapture's t t uh, taking place, and things like that, then it would be a comfort. As about the, If they're saying the rapture's about to take place, then it would be a comfort, as Paul says, in 1 Thessalonians 4. Because he says to comfort one another with these words in regards to the rapture. But you see, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 2, the Thessalonians are shaken in mind, they're troubled. If the letters were just saying the rapture's about to happen... 
that's going to make them excited. And I've heard the post-trib pre-wrath guys in their teaching that the letters were saying that the rapture is at hand. But if that if that's true, then why are they shaking in mind? So I believe that the day of Christ and the day of the Lord, they're the same in the sense that if the events that go along with them happen at the, on the same day. But the day of Christ, when you see it, it's referring to things that go along with the church, with saved people. And the day of the Lord, it's going along with uh, physical things like the second coming, uh, events that take place on earth in the tribulation are sometimes referred to as it being in that day of the Lord. And the millennium, when Jesus sits on a physical throne. So it seems like the day of Christ, more associated with the kingdom of he with the kingdom of God, the church, the, and uh, the day of the Lord, more associated with the kingdom of heaven, God coming in, setting up a physical throne, and doing things that revolve around something physical. As you probably know, the day of the Lord primarily refers to the second coming where Jesus Christ comes down with a vengeance. However, we also know it encompasses events from the tribulation all the way up to the great white throne. Because Second Peter 3 eight says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So the day of the Lord can cover a long time. Because a day with the Lord is a long, long time. So it also makes sense to me that the day of Christ would cover not only the rapture and judgment seat of Christ and marriage supper of the Lamb, but could also be the kingdom of God aspect of the millennial reign of Christ. The day of Christ would represent the kingdom of God, which is a spiritual kingdom. The day of the Lord would go along with the kingdom of heaven, the physical aspect of things. Because in the millennium, Jesus is going to be here, so both kingdoms will be here. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. He's king of both. He's going to be king over a kingdom of God, which is a spiritual kingdom. The body of Christ will be going around in glorified bodies that will represent the kingdom of God, the spiritual side. God will be running on a physical throne. That's the kingdom of heaven. So also consider that the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, are the same day in the sense that they're they have events that happen at the same time, but the day of Christ would be happening for us in heaven and that we go out in a rapture and we go to the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb, all while the world faces wrath from the great tribulation and the second coming. And then that would be the day of the Lord aspect of things. And since the day with the Lord is as a thousand years, both days would go on out into the millennium with two different aspects to them. In the millennium, we, the glorified saints from the church age, will represent the spiritual kingdom of God and continue the day of Christ. And the Jews getting physical land has to do with the kingdom of heaven, with the Lord being exalted as king of kings on a physical throne in Jerusalem. That's the kingdom of heaven. Isaiah 2.17 it says, And the loftiness of men shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day, at the second coming, when he comes in to set up that kingdom. In that day. Notice that phrase, in that day. That's what we're seeing in Second Thessalonians. And I know this is complicated stuff. I'm sorry if it's confusing, and I'm open to correction. There are so many men much older, wiser, smarter, more experienced in the Bible and closer to the Lord that might completely disagree with me on a lot I'm saying. When I, when I have so many great Bible teachers and preachers from years gone by that would disagree with what I'm teaching, uh, it would make it very hard for me to make it a doctrinal fact. You don't want to get lifted up in pride and think the Lord showed you something that he didn't show all these other people. So I'm just doing my best with the chapter. That's all I'm doing. But Second Thessalonians 2, 1 through 2, it says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, 
that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So in review, what seems to have happened is that the Thessalonians were getting letters as from us, as Paul says. He says, as le concerning letters, as from us. They were getting letters from false teachers who were pretenders claiming to be Paul. These letters were making the Thessalonians think they missed the rapture. Therefore, they would be missing other events associated with the day of Christ and would instead face the events of the tribulation and the day of wrath where Jesus Christ will come down in flaming fire taking vengeance. That's why they're shaken in mind and troubled. By the false letters saying, as that the day of Christ is at hand, it was making them think they missed the rapture and that the judgment seat of Christ, the marriage supper of the Lamb, and the millennium were just going to come about without them being on the Lord's side. And this explains why in verse 2, Paul says that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us is that the day of Christ is at hand. What we don't believe is we don't that the, believe that the letters are saying that the rapture is almost here. Because then they would be comforted. The letters had to be saying that the resurrection had already passed and that the judgment seat of Christ was taking place or about to take place, this would make the Thessalonians think, well, hey, if I miss the rapture and the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage supper of Lamb are about to take place or are taking place right now, then I'm about to see that day, the day of the Lord, when he comes back in flaming fire taking vengeance. So they're shaken in mind and troubled. So this shows us plainly that the letters were not saying that the rapture of the church is about to happen as the post-trib pre-wrath people teach. And because a few chapters back in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul tells us about the rapture and says to comfort one another with these words. Something that comforts doesn't shake you in mind and make you troubled. So in 2 Thessalonians 2, it has to be referring to the day of Christ in terms of the judgment seat of Christ and other events associated with the day of Christ and not just the rapture aspect of it. So they thought they missed the rapture and that the judgment seat of Christ was about to take place without them or them being there present and that they would be seeing that, that day, that, that day of the Lord was about to take place. Now, there are great Bible believers who teach that the day of Christ has nothing to do with the rapture or judgment city of Christ. So, I'll give you examples of why I believe it refers to both the rapture and the judgment seat of Christ. In Philippians 2, 15 and 16, it says that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. So he's going to rejoice in the day of Christ in regards to his labor. That is what you would do at the judgment seat of Christ. Have you labored for the Lord with the right motive? That's what the judgment seat of Christ is about. Your labor and what sort it is. If so, if you've got labor with the good motive, you'll be able to rejoice in the day of Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. And then in Philippians 1.10, it says that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ. So being sincere and without offense to the day of Christ. So this shows us that the day of Christ is also the rapture of the church. Because in this present body we are in, we need to keep ourselves, as the verse said, sincere and without offense till the rapture. Or day of Christ. But at the rapture, you get a glorified body. And being without offense will be guaranteed in that body. So when Paul says that you may be sincere and without offense the day of Christ, he's meaning you need to work on walking in the Spirit and not fulfilling the lusts of the flesh to the day of Christ. Because at the day of Christ, you'll get a new body. And then those things will be guaranteed in your new body. So if uh, the, if the day of Christ didn't refer to the rapture here, 
and it just referred to like just the the end of the tribulation or something you, you wouldn't be have to work on being sincere without offense to the day of christ you would already <clears throat> you would um already have your glorified body before the day of christ if it didn't mean the rapture here and then you you would just be already sincere and without offense guaranteed Now, let's go back to 2 Thessalonians. Verse 1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, never let it ask from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, this gets tough because Paul says that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So two things happen before that day. Remember, we talked about in that day. What is that referring to? There's two things that have to happen before that day. And that is a falling away and the man of sin being revealed. So which day is it? Notice it says that day. The confusion will go away <coughs> when you realize that that day is not referring to the rapture. It's referring to the day of the Lord's vengeance. That day shall not come. Referring back to chapter 1 where it uses the same phrase that day in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 10, let's read it again. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he shall be come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Notice, there's the phrase, that day. That day is when the Lord is revealed from heaven, coming back down with a vengeance. So that day is when the Lord is revealed in the sense of him coming back in a vengeance, not when he meets us in the air at the rapture. That will clear up their confusion. Because the, that day shall not, that shall not come is talking about this, not the rapture of the church. So this is not giving you two signs that have to happen before the rapture. So 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, the second coming, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So what Paul is saying is that day, the day when Jesus Christ is revealed, coming back in a vengeance, it won't come until you have a falling away and the men of sin being revealed, the son of perdition. So this means the son of perdition has to be revealed before Jesus Christ is revealed in that day when he comes in flaming fire taking vengeance, not before he comes to get us in the rapture, but before he comes back with us on white horses at the second coming. At the rapture, he comes to get the saints at the second coming, the Lord is revealed and comes back with the saints. In the Antichrist, the man of sin, in the man of sin, the son of perdition, is not revealed before the rapture. He's revealed before the second coming. Now, and that goes to another thing. I don't believe him being revealed is what you think it is either. And I also don't believe the falling away is what you think it is. I don't believe that the falling away has to happen before the rapture. Although I do believe a falling away does happen before the rapture. I don't believe that the Antichrist shows up before the rapture. It means these two things show up before the Lord is revealed in that day in flaming fire taking vengeance. Specifically at the second coming when he comes back with us. So the problem comes when you make the chapter be primarily about the rapture when he comes back to get us, when it's actually primarily about the second coming, when he comes back with us. So I believe the falling away is a falling away 
that actually takes place in the tribulation after the church has already left. For, for a long time, I believed it was the falling away of the church, which there is a falling away of the church. But in the context, this was one in the tribulation. In Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, it says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, notice, if they shall fall away, to renew them again into repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So the fall, this falling away is obviously in the, in the tribulation time period when somebody takes the mark and it becomes impossible to renew them again into repentance. Uh, that's not doctrinally for us today because it's always possible for somebody to be saved. There's nothing somebody can do today that would disqualify them from believing on Jesus Christ and being saved. In the tribulation, if they take the mark, they're damned. And it's impossible. It would be impossible for them to have repentance. And that's what the falling away is. Is, you know, people taking the mark, worshiping the beast. And then in Hebrews 10, 38 and 39. Now remember, the man of sin, the Antichrist, is called the son of perdition. And in a few chapters later in Hebrews 10, it says, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe of the, to the saving of the soul. I believe the falling away has to do with people going for the Antichrist, choosing the Antichrist, whether whatever it be for, for money, just to stay alive, whatever. That's the falling away. So I believe the falling away doctrinally is men falling away in the great tribulation when they take the mark of the beast, worship his image, bow down to him, and so on and so forth. I don't believe the falling away is the falling away of the church age. Although I believe there is a falling away of the church age before the rapture. Because all ages end in apostasy. End in the falling away. I just don't believe the one in 2 Thessalonians 2 is, is the church is falling away. Now 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 3. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ... And by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter asked from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that men of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So I believe this falling away is specifically in the tribulation. Remember, every age ends in apostasy. There isn't just one at the end of the church. Although I do believe there is one at the end of the church, there is people falling away throughout the scriptures. I mean, you see it over and over in the book of Judges. The common belief is that the falling away has to be at the end of the church. And that's what makes people, because they, they keep thinking this is about the rapture. Now also, the next thing Paul says, "...and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition." Something has to happen before the Lord is revealed at the second coming. Not before he comes in the rapture. And the next thing that has to happen before he's revealed at the second coming is that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. A common teaching is that this has to be referring to the Antichrist showing up at the beginning of the tribulation or, or, or right before it. And so to them, that would mean that the Antichrist must show up before the rapture takes place. However, I don't believe that <coughs> is when the man of sin, the son of perdition, is revealed. Because when that man shows up at the beginning of the tribulation, he comes in peaceably. And he obtains the kingdom by flatteries. He shows up making a covenant with the Jews. In Daniel eleven twenty one, it says, And in his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom. But he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. 
I, will, I believe he will deceive the people, the entirety of the tribulation, but the first three and a half years, he's going to come in peaceably. He's going to fix things up. <coughs> and the first three and a half years, he's not seen as that wicked. Then you know the story as it's laid out for us in the book of Revelation. Because the Antichrist is going to be killed in the middle of the seven year period. And he's killed after the first three and a half years. Then his deadly wound is healed and he is going to go another three and a half years. I believe the last three and a half years is when he is revealed as the man of sin, the son of perdition, not at the beginning. Let's look at the verses concerning this in Revelation 13. I really want to go slow on this and make it plain to you what I believe about it. I mean, I could be flat out wrong. But I want to show you, make it plain what I'm trying to get across here. In Revelation 13, 1 through 8, this is about the Antichrist here. It says, And I stood up on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. So he's getting a head wound here. It's a deadly head wound. And his deadly wound is healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. So this guy, he gets a deadly head wound in the middle of the tribulation. And he's going to come back to life. And they're going to wonder after him. Because this, this is a counterfeit of the resurrection of Jesus. It says, And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. So they worshipped the devil. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is likened to the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies that will match the abomination of desolation. He's going to sit in the temple claiming to be God. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months, another three and a half years. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the Lamb book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So at this time, this is when the Antichrist is going to stand in the temple and open his mouth in blasphemy, claiming to be God. And this doesn't happen at the beginning of the tribulation. This happens in the middle. And you know how this is referred to in Matthew 24. Matthew 24, 15 and 16. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then them which be in Judea, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. This is when the Antichrist sits in the temple claiming to be God. And I believe 2 Thessalonians 2 shows that this is referring to when he is revealed. This happens in the middle of the tribulation, not at the beginning. So therefore, the man of sin being revealed, the son of perdition, is not a, something that has to take place before the rapture of the church. Because the rapture, the, the church happens way before the middle. I don't believe 2 Thessalonians is saying he has to be revealed before the rapture of the church. And if that sounds crazy, I'm going to go into it even further and show you what I mean. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, the very next verse will match Matthew 24, 15 and Revelation 13, because what did we just read in Revelation 13? He got a deadly head wound, he resurrected. He's speaking great things and blasphemies. In Matthew 24, 15, it speaks of the abomination of desolation, the Antichrist sitting in the temple. Now, 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, 
who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And so notice Paul is referring to when he sits in the temple claiming to be God, which is the abomination of desolation in Matthew 24. And this is after he receives the deadly wound in Revelation 13 and begins to open his mouth in blasphemy. So the context is not the beginning of the tribulation or right before it. The context is not referring to the rapture of the church at all, but actually referring to the middle of the tribulation, the middle of that horrible future time period where the Antichrist is sitting in the temple claiming to be God. That's where the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. So to say that we have to believe... <clears throat> The Antichrist must be revealed before the rapture seems a bit far-fetched when you look at the context of when this chapter is talking about. It's what I'm trying to say. However, there are great Bible believers who teach that the Antichrist must be revealed before the tribulation. I don't believe that that's such a horrible false teaching because the church could easily have it revealed to them who he is before they left in the rapture. I just don't believe that it's a necessity that that would happen before the rapture takes place. So I believe the falling away and the man of sin being revealed must happen before the second advent, before the Lord returns in that day in flaming fire taking vengeance. But I don't believe the falling away and the man of sin being revealed refer to events that must take place before the rapture of the church. I personally don't believe that there are any signs for the rapture. It could happen right now. Also, the Antichrist sitting in the temple while born-again believers of the church are still here would have no effect anyway because Paul tells us that our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost in the church age. God has a people for a, a temple today. Our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. In the tribulation, it's not that way. The body of Christ is left. Things go back to being about more physical things, not spiritual things. Now, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 6. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth, and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth, <coughs> that he might be revealed in his time. Notice Paul says, now you know what withholdeth. What is it? It's in the next verse. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The mystery of iniquity has to do with the Antichrist. His spirit is already at work today. And I'll show you what I mean by these verses in 1 John. For, uh, John talks a lot about it. 1 John 2, 18. He says, little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that any Christ, that any Christ shall come. Even now are there many antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. So he says, already there are many antichrists. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. And he says in 1 John 2, 22, who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. So that's the Antichrist spirit at work. Anybody who denies the deity of Jesus Christ. 1 John 4, 3, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. So the Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist is already at work, paving the way. 
2 John 1, 7, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. People that go against the deity of Christ, that's a spirit of antichrist. So the mystery of iniquity is already at work today, according to all these verses. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now we come to another very controversial topic in 2 Thessalonians 2. Who is the he who now letteth? Now let here doesn't mean to allow, but actually to, to not allow, to withhold. That is why Paul says, now you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now there's so many different um, teachings about this. Common teachings is that the he is the body of Christ being removed so that the Antichrist can show up. I certainly agree that the body of Christ leaves before the tribulation. However, by the context, remember, at this point, we are in the middle of the tribulation when the Antichrist is going to sit in the temple claiming to be God. And the body of Christ would have already left three and a half years prior to this. So that's why I don't believe that the he is referring to the body of Christ because in the context, we're in the middle of the tribulation when the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, and sits in the temple claiming to be God, showing his true colors. Another interpretation is that the he is the Holy Spirit leaving because he is the only one who can keep the Antichrist from showing up. Now, I do believe the Holy Spirit operates much, much differently in the tribulation than he does in the church age. I just don't believe the context teaches that the He is the Holy Spirit. So I respectfully disagree with those who teach that. But like I said, I'm, I'm not 100% sure what I'm teaching in this chapter. I'm just giving it my best shot. I just don't see that, though, by the context. Because remember, the context puts us in the middle of the tribulation and not, the, not at the beginning. The, the Holy Spirit would have done been working much differently for the last three and a half years by this point. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. I believe the he who now letteth is actually just the man of sin. The mystery of iniquity being already at work is keeping is what's keeping the devil from taking complete control as the son of perdition. And I've said that before to people and they just laughed in my face because, you know, they teach us the Holy Spirit or the body of Christ. So I understand, <clears throat> I understand that sounds crazy because, you know, if you've never heard something before, if you've been saved for 40 years and you've never heard something before, it's going to sound crazy to you. But I mean, I'm not the first person to teach this. People way older than me have taught this, probably way older than you, done been dead and gone have taught what I'm trying to tell you here, is that the he who now letteth will let is the man of sin is taken out of the way so that the devil can have complete control, have complete worship. So the mystery of iniquity has been at work in people who deny the deity of Jesus Christ, the antichrist throughout history, the mystery of iniquity has been alive through the Pope and the Catholic Church. It's been at work through the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons. And in the middle of the tribulation, the Antichrist is going to get a deadly wound. He's going to die and he's going to resurrect. And Satan takes full control. And he's not going to want to share worship with any religion, even if it's a false religion. The man of sin and mystery of iniquity working were withholding in the sense that they were keeping the devil from getting direct, exclusive worship. But after the Antichrist counterfeit resurrection, the devil enters into him and they must worship him directly. That's what I believe is going on. 
The man of sin or any Christ will get a deadly wound. And when he's healed, he comes back to life as Satan incarnate. And he's going to oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. He's wanting to be up there at the top. He wants to be like the Most High. He said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the Most High. He's not going to want to share any worship. So he's, he's not going to be for any of the false religions after this point. Now, he's been for them all through, throughout time. He's been a part of setting them up. But at this point, he's wanting that exclusive direct worship. And the mystery of iniquity that's been work at work throughout this time, and the man of sin himself is gonna, is, has be, would be withholding him from getting that. But when that man of sin is taken out of the way by a deadly wound in the middle of the tribulation, when he resurrects, it's going to be literally Satan incarnate. The same way Jesus is God manifested in the flesh, the person that gets up is going to be the devil manifested in the flesh in the middle of the tribulation when that man of sin resurrects satan's gonna be in him and the reason i believe that is because look what it says in the very next verse in second thessalonians 2 8 and then shall that wicked be revealed capital w that wicked be revealed <coughs> Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy <clears throat> with the brightness of his coming. Once again, not the context of the rapture, but the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. When he's going to consume the Antichrist by the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So... That day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed. The man of sin is not revealed before the rapture. He's revealed before Jesus Christ is revealed at the second coming. That's the context of the chapter. That's how I see it. So I, d I still don't have that there being signs for the rapture. Now notice he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked, capital W, be revealed. And 1 John 3, 12 also calls the devil that wicked when it says Cain was of that wicked one. The resurrected Antichrist will literally be Satan manifested in the flesh, just as Jesus Christ is God manifested in the flesh. And if you want a pattern... You know, if you're like me, you like patterns for things. If you want a pattern, consider Judas Iscariot. He was a devil before the devil entered into him. He was already bad. But then when Satan entered into him, he became evil enough to betray Jesus Christ. Also consider how both of them are called the son of perdition. In John 13, 27, it says, And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. So Judas, and before this, the Lord said, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? That's before he betrayed him. And now, <clears throat> Satan is actually entering into him. <clears throat> and Luke 22, 3 through 6. Then answered Satan, they are then entered Satan into Judas, Cernum Discariot, being of the number of the twelve. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains, how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and covenanted to, to give him money. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. So Judas Iscariot is a devil before the devil enters into him. The devil has to enter into him to get him to do something that's so wicked. The devil goes into the Antichrist to get him to do something even more wicked than he was already doing. Now, if you're still not convinced, which you, you may not be, if you're still not convinced, that's fine. If you don't agree with me, I, 
I'm fine, really. With, if you want to make the he who now let us will let be the body of Christ or the Holy Spirit, I'm really not going to fight you either way because pretty much all of my favorite teachers teach something, almost, almost all of them. There's a few that don't. Almost all my favorite teachers and preachers would completely disagree with me on this chapter. So I'm not going to disrespect you. I'm not going to be mad at you if you disagree. And I hope you'll give me the same respect. But now, if you're still not convinced, I want to show you by the context even more that the he is referring to the man of sin withholding the devil from taking full control. And that the he is not the Holy Spirit or the body of Christ. Now, notice how many times you have the word he and himself. Those two words, he and himself, referring to the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians 2. Also, notice how many times it just refers to one of his other names in the context. In the context, it's referring to the mystery of iniquity, the man of sin, the son of perdition. So let's look at 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. That man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, the, both of those, that's the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition. Notice, it's talking about him here calling him the man of sin, the son of perdition. In verse 4, who opposeth and exalteth himself, himself, that's the Antichrist, above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, the Antichrist, as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself, himself, that's the Antichrist, that he, is God, the he there, that's the Antichrist. In verse 4, it says himself twice, and it says he twice, all four times. That's the Antichrist that it's referring to. Then it says, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now you know what withholdeth, that he, the he there's the Antichrist, might reveal, be revealed in his time. He is, that's the Antichrist, and the the great time of the great tribulation. Now we get to verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity, that goes along with the, with the Antichrist, doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Then you have two more he's here in verse 7, where it says, Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. So if you make the he be the body of Christ, or anything other than the man of sin, it seems to go against the whole context of the chapter. <clears throat> because all the he's and the himselfs before this verse were in reference to the Antichrist, not to the body of Christ, not to the Holy Spirit, not to Michael the Archangel. Some people say that the he who not let us will let us Michael the Archangel. So not only does the context put you in the middle of the tribulation when the Antichrist is opposing, exalting himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, sitting in the temple claiming to be God, it, the context puts you in the middle of the tribulation. But also every time it was saying he or himself, it was referring to the man of sin himself. And so when you get to verse 7, it says only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. It makes sense to me that those two he's would be referring to all the other he's and the himselfs throughout the whole chapter, the first part of the chapter. So while I do believe the Holy Spirit does operate much, much differently in the tribulation, so I can see why they would say it's the Holy Spirit being taken out of the way. I do believe it's that the Holy Spirit's operating much different in the tribulation and will be, in a sense, taken out of the way and how he operates, operating more like he did in the Old Testament. I don't believe that he who now letteth is the Holy Spirit. I don't believe the body of Christ leaves uh, during the middle of the tribulation or after the tribulation. So I also believe that the body of Christ is gone before this point. But I just don't believe that the he who now letteth will let is referring to the body of Christ. Because I believe the body of Christ left three and a half years before this point even takes place. So if the context is in the middle, then the body of Christ would have already been taken out of the way way before. The Holy Spirit would have already started operating much differently 
three and a half years before this, not dealing with men the same way as it does today, like he is doing in the church age. I just don't believe that the he who now letteth will let is the Holy Spirit or the body of Christ, is what I'm trying to say. And, I mean, in a sense, the body of Christ and the Holy Spirit, the body of Christ will leave and the Holy Spirit's going to operate differently before the Antichrist is revealed. But still, that's not what the he who now letteth will let is, I don't believe. So it says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 8, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. The Lord destroys him with the brightness of his coming. We know this to be when he comes at the end of the tribulation, at the end of the great tribulation. So once again, we see that the context is more about the Lord coming back in vengeance at the second coming, and not when he comes to get us at the rapture. The problem is that the Thessalonians thought they missed the rapture, and all the other events associated with the day of Christ were now going to, t or were now uh, taking place or about to take place, and that they were going to miss those things, and they were going to face the day of wrath. So Paul is trying to give them some consolation by letting them know that they aren't presently going through the tribulation, and that the day of the Lord's wrath isn't going to happen. They're not going through it. They think they're going through it. But the day of the Lord's wrath is not going to happen until there is a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed. He's trying to let them know, hey, you're, you didn't miss the rapture. You're not going to go through the tribulation. You're not about to face the day of wrath because that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the sin of perdition. And they would know those two things hadn't happened yet. Now, verse 9, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9, even him... Once again, him referring to the Antichrist once again. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So even him, the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Once again, this matches Revelation 13, which is context in the middle of the tribulation, not at the beginning. Because the false prophet and the Antichrist are going to be doing miracles. They're going to have power to do miracles. And notice it mentions this after he's been resurrected in Revelation 13. Placing this in the middle of the tribulation. Revelation 13, 12 through 14. And he exerciseth all of the power of the first beast before him. And causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast. Whose deadly wound was healed. Notice it's after the resurrection of the Antichrist. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. There's your signs and lying wonders. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. There is your strong delusion. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So this causes many to believe that a Christ rejecter who misses the rapture will be automatically damned when the tribulation starts because they will be faced with the strong delusion and they will believe a lie. I do agree that if a man is rejecting the gospel today and misses the rapture, the chances are he will be even further deceived after the rapture. However, I don't personally believe it will be impossible. I don't believe he'll just automatically be damned. Because I believe this, these, this strong delusion and th these things in these verses are happening. This is taking place in the middle when the, when the Antichrist and the false prophet are really showing these signs and lying wonders. And the strong delusion has something to do with that and not something that has to do with the rapture. So the Lord is going to send a strong delusion and that he's, he's going to allow people to be deceived by the 
antichrist and false prophet they will worship the beast in his image they'll take his mark so that they continue to have pleasure and unrighteousness look at revelation 13 again Revelation 13 through 18. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. They're going to think these guys are, 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 are all that. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. That the image of the beef, beast should both speak and and caused that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. That's the strong, the strong delusion has to do with, I believe, that deceiving they're doing with the power signs and lying wonders and they're damned because they're letting that deceive them into getting the mark of the beast which once you get it you're automatically damned i believe the context has to do with the middle of the tribulation going into the second coming not the the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation that's what i'm trying to say now back to second thessalonians 2 and notice how paul clearly begins talking about a completely different group of people and the tone completely changes in the chapter plainly showing us that we're not associated with that stuff that's going on in those previous verses. For the rest of the chapter, Paul is going to describe why we as born-again believers don't have anything to worry about. Notice in 2 Thessalonians 2.13, he says, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Notice that Paul is talking about the saints and saying, he says, beloved of the Lord. God has an everlasting love for the saints. That's not going to burn out. He, uh, Ephesians 5.25, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Notice Paul said, chosen is salvation. You're saved. Nothing's going to change that. And don't forget that we're not chosen until we got in him. The Lord chooses every man who chooses of his own free will to get in him. As it says in Ephesians 1, 4, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. God's just not just choosing who he wants to. He's choosing everybody who chooses to get in him. Now notice Paul said sanctified, so we're set apart. We're set apart forever the moment we got saved. Paul said, and believed the truth. If you're a born-again believer, then you are a born-again believer because you believed the truth, specifically the truth from 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He shed His blood on the cross for our sins, was buried, resurrected. If you're believing on that to be saved, then you're saved and you're going out in a rapture before the tribulation. You're not going to face that day. You're not going to see... What Second Thessalonians 2 is talking about where the man of sin is opposing and exalting himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. In Second Thessalonians 2, 14, we're unto, he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's gospel, as I said earlier, mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, notice that if you have believed the gospel, you obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. See how it's talking about a completely different group of people a group of people that's not going through any of those horrible events. Second Thessalonians 2.15, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or our epistles. He wants the Thessalonians to hold on to traditions. Traditions are good if they are biblical traditions. He doesn't want them tossed to and fro and cared about with every wind of doctrine. He doesn't want them led astray by phony epistles with his name forged on it. 2 Thessalonians 2, 16, Thy our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Everlasting consolation. The things the Lord gives you are everlasting. If you have eternal life today and lose it tomorrow, then it was just temporary. 
Temporary salvation doesn't give everlasting consolation. Eternal security does. And if you go through that horrible time period that they're saying you're going through the tribulation, then you're going to be in danger of being able to take the mark of the beast. If you take the mark, you're damned. That's not everlasting consolation. God's not putting going to put you in that situation. Second Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.17 Comfort your hearts. Establish you in every good word and work. Notice the words hope, grace, comfort, consolation. If Jesus Christ is dragging his bride through the tribulation and his wrath, then that would be contrary to these verses. Hope, grace, comfort, consolation. So this has been my best attempt at explaining 2 Thessalonians 2. And I'm tired now.